All right, let's, uh, let's make a start the uh, afternoon for the first talk of the afternoon by Yakov Schlappentop Rothman. He'll be talking about naked singularities for the Einstein vacuum equations. Please. So thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, please uh, stop me if you have any questions. I can't see the chat screen or, but anyway, so speak up. Um, and, and stop me. Okay, so I'm gonna, there'll be sort of three parts uh, to the talk. Um, in the first part, I want to take, I'm going to do sort of a quick review of weak cosmic censorship and naked singularities, not because I think that the audience doesn't already know what these are, but just as an excuse to fix some notation and, um, you know, sneak in some sort of philosophical remarks. Okay, so what is weak cosmic censorship? In three plus one dimensions, uh, there is a chat. When he turns away from the computer, his voice goes away. All right, I won't do that then. Um, so what is weak cosmic censorship? In three plus one dimensions for the Einstein vacuum equation, it's basically the statement that if you start with initial data, which is nice, meaning say complete, regular, asymptotically flat, then of course singularities can emerge, um, as we all know, but they're always, at least generically, are hidden inside a black hole. And so sort of colloquially, if we don't want to deal with them, sort of we don't have to. All right, so some, some, some remarks. So um, one interesting thing, which I think sometimes is sort of um, uh, somehow, somehow forgotten in the story, uh, sort of interesting is that when this, as far as I understand, at the time of the original formulation, there wasn't really a reason why it should be true other than that it would be really convenient. So certainly all explicit examples sort of satisfied it. Um, okay, uh, and, and somehow, Again, sort of my understanding of the matter is the only sort of uh, you know possible heuristic mecha mechanism for why you know uh, uh, generic singularity sh should be hidden in the black hole is, is only really sort of understood um, even a possible mechanism understood by certain uh, spherically symmetric um, model problems studied by Chris Dula in, in these famous works in the '90s, um, which I'll talk about more later. And, and furthermore, not only did this provide say first sort of indication of kind of a heuristic mechanism, but it's also only from these works that, you know, we really kind of understand that you need to put the word generic in, in this conjecture. Okay. Um, and finally, there's, uh, I sort of quickly slipped in some words in this conjecture, say regular singularities. And as with sort of other fundamental questions in relativity, perhaps most famously strong cosmos censorship and, you know, what kind of, what, what, what regularity classes you, you should use there, that, that that story. Similarly, here in principle, it's very important what um, you know, what precise definition you give for for regular and, and how precisely you define singularity. Okay. Um, so having opened that Pandora's box, let me um, uh, take the opportunity to just have a quick uh, sort of philosophical digression about what possibly regular initial data and singularity should be. Okay. So so of course, um, when, when you ask most people this, the first thing they're going to say is, well. I should just say regular means that it's smooth, right? And then singular means it's not smooth anymore. Okay, of course that that has a certain uh, appeal to it, um, and, and it suffices, of course, in many in many situations. But uh, you know, I claim it's, it's actually quite naive from various perspectives. For example, there's certainly plenty of non-smooth solutions to the Einstein vacuum equations that we we accept as being, being totally physical. And you know, to claim that something you know, which is C five million and not, not smooth is sort of, you know, it, it's not, it's, it's hard to actually justify that. That being said, I, I'm not gonna give an answer for what the correct functional framework is, but, but, but just, you know, but maybe some, some basic necessary conditions you need. You certainly want some kind of whatever functional framework you have, you need to have well posedness for the Cauchy problem because that's fundamental that we um, think about classical general relativity. And moreover, you, you probably want the, the certain phenomenology that, that, that is so near and dear to us that, that we, we would never want to give up so that you better be able to understand whatever you do. So one, perhaps the most important example would be stability in Mikowski space. So whatever functional framework you use, stability in Mikowski space should be true or it's probably not, um, not a good way to look at it. Okay, so let's uh, close that digression and move on. All right, so um, again, I just, like I said, in this first part, I just want to fix fix some notation here. So, um, so what is a naked singularity? A naked singularity is a singularity which is not in a black hole. Um, okay, and sort of you can, you can more precisely say it as follows. So, 
So basically we wanna start again with some nice data. I'm going to, for convenience, work with characteristic data. So we're gonna consider data on an asymptotically flat cone, which is regular with all of the caveats of the previous slide. So whatever you decide regular should mean. And then, um, and then at some point there's a singularity, whatever you decide that should mean. And then, um, so what does it mean that it's naked? It means basically that you take some ingoing null geodesics um, from this asymptotically flat cone, you parallel transport them out to the asymptotically flat end. And then when you solve in the ingoing direction, um, you, always, you hit the future cone of the singularity in finite, finite affine time, some fixed finite affine time. All right, so sort of no matter how far you go out, you, you, you always see the singularity and you always have to stop. All right, this, this is the, the, bat, the thing that we don't want. Okay, great. All right, so now, so, so I mentioned before these, uh, these works of Chris Sidulu, um, so let me just say briefly in, in a little more detail. Um, so so, what, so what, what was the model that he studied? It's sort of this, um, you know, possibly the, the canonical model to study in, in spherical symmetry, um, the, that is the Einstein scalar field um, model, all right? Because it's, uh, all right, it's, it's um, what's the point? It's so you, you can impose spherical symmetry while, make, while keeping dynamical degrees of freedom, so that greatly simplifies things, but sort of, Experience has shown us that that um, uh, that results that hold um, for the Einstein scalar field system and spherical symmetry do often give us lots, lots of good intuition. So, so this is a very reasonable model to start with. Okay, and what were his main results? Um, well, they're actually there are a bunch of results, but this is sort of just a quick summary. So, first of all, I, I sort of already mentioned this. Um, he showed that there do exist naked singularities for for the spherically symmetric Einstein scalar field system. So, if you believe that this is a good model for vacuum that that's suggesting that we need to put, you know, it's not going to be the case that the bad solutions never exist. Best could be generically. Okay, but and then, um, and perhaps, you know, most interestingly, he showed that indeed, generically, um, these, these do not occur. Okay, so this is sort of um, some kind of full resolution of, of that problem um, in spherical symmetry. Okay, so that's great. Um, so that, that's from the 90s. Um, all right, so, so I should also I would be sort of remiss to give a talk with the word naked singularity in the title if I didn't also mention that somehow in parallel to this works of Chris Adulu, there's an enormous um, heuristic and numerical literature that develops associated to naked singularities, which, which are related to often related to critical phenomena. These are often discreetly self-similar. I'm not really going to say more about it because they'll turn out not to be the ones which are really relevant for, for what I'm talking about. But, th but this is also an enormously important sort of world. Okay. Um, any questions? I don't know if I can see the questions on the, all right, keep going. Okay, so, all right, so now let's sort of transition back to, to sort of the main, main thing, the main topic of this talk. All right, so what about naked singularities for the Einstein vacuum equations? So despite Chris Adula's example, all right, and so you'd think, okay, so given that, it's very natural to try to do an analogous thing in vacuum. There hasn't really been much progress for constructing naked singularities for the Einstein vacuum equations. So why is that? That might seem surprising because, right, it, it's it's one thing to have be difficult to prove with cosmic censorship. Another, you might think, okay, but it's just do an example. Can't you just sort of lift his example somehow? Um, and and the reason is okay. Basically, his his construction relies on. So he started with the spherically symmetric Einstein scalar field system. He opposed another symmetry on top of that. There's sort of so many symmetries that the system collapses. So it is a two-dimensional autonomous system. It's still not, you know, easy to understand in any sense, but still it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's low dimensionality means that you can use sort of, you know, space plane analysis that, um, uh, and somehow that, that's crucial to understanding the, this full zoo of solutions. And he's able to find one in there, um, which corresponds to a naked singularity. But for the Einstein vacuum equations, there's no kind of, um, there's no symmetry you can introduce that's compatible with asymptotic flatness that would lead to anything like this kind of production. So, so you can't, that general path is not available to you. And on the other hand, if you try to say, okay, well, maybe I'll just try to clever, maybe motivated by Chris Field, I'll try to cook up some initial data, which I think will lead to a naked singularity. You know, whatever you do, you're gonna to have to simultaneously solve a low regularity problem because there's a singularity, right? And some type of global existence problem, maybe more precisely a semi-global existence problem, since you're going to have to understand enough of the space time to say that a black hole doesn't form, right? Um, okay, so that, that sort of gives the problem its, its characteristic mathematical difficulty. Um, okay, but despite um, this, um, the main thing I want to talk about today is that, that there do exist naked singularities. 
Okay, and the sort of in the rest of the talk, I'm going to first review Chris Adulu's solutions in more details because they, in, in many ways, his solutions will be qualitatively similar to the naked singularities I want to talk about. And, and, and but the, it's, it's simpler because it's directly symmetric because that's a good window to understand things. And then once I do that, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of present um, our main results. Okay, so maybe that's a natural time now. So are there any questions? No, great. Okay, part two, Chris is doing solutions. All right, so the first, um, the first important thing to understand um, for his constructions are to look at the symmetries of the Einstein scalar field system. All right, so remember, um, this is solution to the Einstein equations, which are spherically symmetric, and there's a scalar field, right? So we can think of our unknowns as, so we can quotient out by the spherical symmetry, and then there's, we get a one plus one dimensional metric uh, called that H. Then you have the function R, which tells you the area, every point, right? There's like the SO3 is acting on it, so that gives you the area of the sphere it's on, and then you have the scalar field. So I mean, we can think of these as our unknowns. All right. First symmetry that we have is the basic rescaling symmetry that we sort of all know and love. If you, for any positive constant A, you can, um, you know, sort of correspond to a change of units, right? You can multiply H by A squared, R by A, don't touch the scalar field. This will still be a solution to the Einstein vacuum equations, right? Okay, but I said there too, there's another symmetry. This one we usually think of as kind of being a trivial symmetry. Um, this, uh, for any um, real number, we can add, this is, and this is here, it's important that we're studying a massless scalar field. Um, we can just add a constant to the scalar field, and that'll still be a solution to the I said, usually that, that, that one's sort of considered like, you might think that's kind of a trivial symmetry. Okay. Great, and then this leads to a definition to call um, K self-similarity. So we say a solution, um, H R phi, is K self-similar if there exists a one parameter family of diffeomorphisms, or if you want, one parameter family of coordinate changes. So sort of like when you, when you, zoom, you, you do this coordinate change, you zoom in, so usual self-similarity would be that you do some set of coordinate changes, you look in and you just see like a smaller version of your space. Right? So this, the K self-similar um, refers to that, okay, you zoom in and you, all right, as far as the, ge pure ge the geometric part, the H and R are concerned, you see some, you know, a smaller version say, but what we do, what makes it a little more complicated is we allow the scalar field to get translated by some amount, depending on how much you zoomed in. So this, get, so, so in this, the coupling between the sort of the rescaling, the S, is determined by the constant k. So this, that's the k self support. Right, so, so the sort of the simpler version where we don't touch the scalar field, that's sort of, uh, we're gonna call that scale invariant. And that's, that's like sort of one's intuitive notion of what it would mean to be self similar You just zoom in and it looks like we scale thing. Okay, um, cool. All right, so it turns out that um, what's sort of interesting, again, this is because you've already you know, eliminated lots of degrees of freedom by studying the scalar field system spherical symmetry. When you also impose scale invariant, you can just write down all the solutions. All right, and I drew a picture here of well, there's sort of there's sort of there's small ones and there's large ones, and then there's there's ones in between. I drew the picture here of what the sort of small scale invariant ones look like. Um, so these are completely parametrized. There's a lot of rigidity. They're completely parametrized by the value of the derivative of the scalar field. Um, you know, it, you can pick your on say I drew this. There's this white dot in the middle of the screen. That's think of that's sort of the center of dilation symmetry. Um, and these solutions are completely parametrized by the value of the derivative of the scalar field, say, anywhere on, the, on that cone. And what they look like, it's, it's sort of interesting, um, kind of funny behavior. In the past of this, at this point, everything is completely flat. It's trivial. Then all of a sudden, the scalar field sort of wakes up. There's some derivative here. And then in this exterior region, something non-trivial happens. I'm not telling you what, it's not so important. And then what's sort of funny is that somehow everything bounces out. And then to the future, it then becomes completely flat again. This is kind of like a linear, you know, like a linear three plus one dimensional wave equation almost. Um, sort sort of amusing. Um, okay, that, that's of course the fact that it comes in, bounces, and goes out. That's related to it being a small one. When 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 you look when you increase the value of the scalar field above some critical threshold, then you know it doesn't bounce out. There's some trap surface formation. Anyway, um, so what but what can we say about these solutions? All right, so like I said, so these are flat. And then all of a sudden the derivative of the scalar field shows up. So that's sort of telling you there's some lack of regularity. Um, it turns out that the scalar field is only continuous here. So you might think, okay, that's not great. But if you sort of 
you know, as I sort of pushed to my earlier philosophical digression, if we don't sort of get scared that it's not smooth and we just look at it, take it, try to take it seriously, the solution, you see that these are, these are perfectly physical solutions. And this just represents basically um, a spherical impulsive gravitational wave, which say in this picture I drew, when it's small, it just, you know, comes in, it's a center and bounces out. And there's nothing objectionable about this. Certainly it has nothing to do with naked singularities because it's actually, it's a perfectly fine solution. Okay. Okay, the second ingredient I need before I talk about Christopher's naked singularities is I don't want to get too derailed on this, but just, just mention quickly is a certain well posedness result that Christy Julu showed for the Einstein scalar field system of spherical symmetry. All right, under in the class of so-called solutions of bounded variation. It's not important what this means really. I just just but um, one way to think about it is. Bounded variation space times are ones that when you zoom in, if you, if you, so of course, if you have a smooth space time and you zoom in on a point, eventually you see just flat space, right? So these ones are, are pretty singular. You don't necessarily see flat space when you zoom in, but when you zoom in, eventually you see one of these, right? And, and I sort of, I made the claim that these are kind of reasonable. So they're singular, but they're reasonable. So that, that's, that's one way to think about these. Solutions. Of course, they're, they're much more complicated. Than that. It makes it look. Okay, great. So with these ingredients, um, sort of explained, we can talk about his naked singularities now. So the naked singularities arose when he turned on that more non-trivial symmetry, that this K, the K and the K self-similarity. So um, like I said, these you cannot write down explicitly, but I mentioned um, before that, you know, it's, it's a, you can study, it's a two-dimensional autonomous system and you can try to understand the, the phase plane. And he's able to find ones which have exactly this, this is, I already showed you this Penrose diagram. This is the Penrose diagram of the naked singularity. So he's able to um, find these. But again, they're the caveats, right? I need to tell you uh, his, how regular is initial data, what, what's up with the singularity. Um, okay, so, so let me do that now. So why, why, why is this regular enough and, and singular enough um, to be a naked singularity? Well, as far as the initial data goes, it turns out that the scalar field, it's not smooth, but it's C1 alpha. So the derivative is holder continuous. This, if you compare with bounded variation, so for bounded variation solution, the derivative of the scalar field will be a bounded variation. And, and you see this, that's, this is quantitatively better. So we're better than a space where we have well posedness. On the other hand, you can prove that there's no way to extend to the singular point and remain bounded variation. So we start better than a space where we're well posedness. And we provably, we leave the sort of a space which is, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely worse than BV at the singularity. So that's, you know, this is a precise sense in which, in which these are, um, uh, in which it's sort of, there's, there's a true loss of regularity here. And again, you can more precisely, you can see that in various ways. There, there's a certain kind of, you can look at the Hawking mass as a kind of, you think of that as a kind of scale invariant energy concentration. So you take the Hawking mass of a sphere, you divide by the, by the radius of the sphere, this is a scale invariant quantity. Um, so normally if you take, if you take a sphere and you, and you look at the Hawking mass divided by the, by the area of the sphere, you, you zoom down to a point that should go to zero. But these, the singularity sort of has some, you know, this doesn't go to zero when you do the singularity. That's, that's, one, um, that's one way you can see that you're not BV. Another maybe sort of simpler notion is that the, the scalar field, the, the scalar field blows up logarithmically at the singularity, particularly the derivative of the scalar field um, is, not, is not integrable. And that's actually this, this maybe looks like it depends on coordinates because that's actually reparameterization invariant. Um, okay, so that's, so that's the story of Chris Adulu's naked singularity. So maybe in just two final remarks. Um, strictly speaking, um, scale invariant solutions will never be asymptotically flat. Just if you just think about how the mass scales, but it, it's not given the solution he found. It, it's quite easy to truncate it and, and just you just delete it once you you have the singularity and then the part that's far out you just sort of delete and, and kind of extend in an asymptotically flat way. That's especially in spherical symmetry that that's not difficult um, to do. So. Um, but technically you have to do that to get something asymptotically flat. And then one, one last thing, um, which would be a natural question to ask at this point, you might say, okay, it's kind of weird. You told me that when K is zero, so when I don't have this twisted symmetry, everything is great. The, the, it, but then all of a sudden you look at this more complicated one, you turn on K, K is positive. You see K is positive, but very small, somehow it's bad. So what's going on when K goes to zero? Well, of course, the only answer can be that that's a singular limit, right? And, um, and, 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 it, and indeed it is. And one way you see that is, so even when you barely turn on K, so you, 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 you sort of this, 
other kind of symmetry you're doing is just barely different than the usual self-similarity. If you look at these solutions, the derivative of the scalar field, at some point, there are points where it will be of size one over square root of k. So, so it's enormous, okay? So it's a very sing singular limit, this k goes to zero. Um, so that, that explains why um, k equals zero could be good, but, but these could be better um, okay as possible. Okay, so that's the story of Chris Sedula. Any questions? No? All right, great. Now that we understand Chris Sedula, let's uh, go to vacuum. Okay, in this part, I'm going to, so I'm going to orient this final part of the talk about and sort of, you know, if, um, Kind of if you construct naked singularities and you're trying to stay as close to sort of Christodoulos path as possible, we'll see sort of what happens along the way. Okay. All right. So the first thing you do is we need to figure out some the you know analog of, of this kind of self. If we're trying to follow Christodoulo, we want an analog of the self-similarity, right? Okay. So that per se is not is not complicated. It's clear that should mean that you have a conformal killing field. We know what that means. That means the lead derivative of the metric is two times the metric. Okay, that's great. Unfortunately, if you want to um, you know, prove anything about the, about the vacuum equations, you have, you have to introduce some kind of gauge. And here, it's not completely unclear what kind of gauge you should introduce to study this problem. Um, you know, for lack of any sort of better idea, we'll just, we'll work with, um, say, double null gauge that's been successful for many problems. Um, okay, why not? But then it's even worse than that because, okay, so I'll work in a double null gauge. But in reality, it's also kind of a gauge choice is what, what should the self-similar field look like? You know, I'm just trying to get started to study something. So I'll, I'll just make, let's just start with a naive guess. You know, in, in, in flat space, in Minkowski space, the, you know, the normal scaling vector field looks like u d by du plus b d by db. So let's, let's start with that, see what happens. But we should definitely remember that these are a bunch of choices. Like there was no real justification starting with this. this. This will come back to sort of haunt us in a way. Okay, but let's, let's do that. Let's, let's see what happens. All right, and then just to, to make this more, more explicit, if of course, if you write out the, 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 the the conformal killing field um, formula in terms of these coordinates. It just means that the various unknown functions in the metric, this, this, this function omega, this vector field B along the spheres, and this G flat, it just means that instead of being functions of U, V, and theta, they're really functions of V over U. And then there's some power of, of U outside determined by scaling. Okay. Okay, great. So what do we, what do, we do with this, right? It turns out there's, there's a very natural thing to first do, which is so. If you remember the I said the scaling vector field is u d by du plus v d by dv. So particularly when v is zero, that is just pointing in the u direction. And so you you can look, um, and, and it's a double null uh, gauge, so that it's pointing along um, it's pointing along v equals zero, which is itself a null hyperspace. There are also there are null constraint equations, so we can look at the null constraint equations. Because of this dilation symmetry, they should collapse and just be an equation on the sphere. So this is a, you know, and it's not like okay, this is just the right. And so what I've written out is just the right to jury equation, sort of col it, it collapsed and became an equation just on the sphere because of the dilation symmetry. So you know, it's everyone's favorite part of the Einstein equation, right? So it's a good place to look first. And if you write it out, okay, it's this, it's this mess, right? Which doesn't look terribly insightful. It just seems like, okay, I mean, you have various free functions and all right, you know one degree of freedom is used up by this needing to be satisfied. But it turns out there's something surprising which happens, um, which is even though this appears to be very underdetermined, um, it, it, it's pretty non-trivial, but, but actually you can show that any solution, there's actually a lot of rigidity here. And any solution to this equation, actually B has to be a killing field of whatever, whatever your metric was on the sphere, and B has to annihilate the, the lapse version. Um, okay. Briefly, one way to think about why this is true, and this is in the small data regime, this can really be made into a proof, is that on the left-hand side, somehow the main term is divergence to B. That wants to integrate to zero, right? It's a divergence. But on the right-hand side, there's the square, there's the square term, right? That's, of course, everyone's favorite monotonicity in right, in right to jury, okay? And that, there's, there's a conflict there. So if you integrate, well, well, divergence wants to be zero. The other side doesn't want to be zero. And if you sort of look at the repercussions of that, you, you, you'll, you sort of, this, um, this rigidity will pop out. Okay, but then there's even more. Um, so then you can, once you have this, you, you can show that actually, if you had a solution like this, you could do another sort of scale invariant change of coordinates. So which preserves the form and actually make everything completely trivial along 
this vehicle is along this null hypersurface where the dilation of variant field points. So what it tells you is that there's going to be the special null hypersurface where everything just has to be trivial. It's, it's sort of a surprising consequence of right to do it. Okay, but that's fine. I mean, just that's just on this one hypersurface, you know, things could change off that. So, so it's, not, it's not the end of the world per se. All right. Um, okay, so let's continue. All right, and, and then also what's sort of fortunate is that we don't have to study this problem from scratch. So it turns out they were really studying something. They were really interested in something completely different. Um, there's, there's this famous work, a Pfefferman and Graham, um, already back in 1985, which, okay, they, they work in a completely different gauge. So, so if, you, if you look at their book, you won't see any U and V coordinates, but, but you can translate what they did. And, and, and basically, um, one thing that follows from the work is the uh, sort of classification and existence of formal power series for such metrics. And, and basically the power series will be in V over U, which is sort of, like I said, the function, most functions are natural. If you assume self-similarity, the functions are naturally sort of depend on V over U. That's the natural variable, of course, and the angular coordinates. Um, right, and what, what they saw is that sort of, like I said, the, there's this rigidity, all, a lot of this tangent, this data along V equals zero itself has to be trivial. But then as you go off, I didn't say anything. And what they found is that the, exactly you have the free, you know, this particular transversal derivative of G slash, some part of the metric, and the exact, that exact is not important, just they cost, but there's some transversal derivative that that can be whatever you want, and then everything else sort of falls, right? And so I sort of drew, if you want, um, kind of formally the range of their power series. So this V equals zero, this is where things kind of have to be trivial. And then as you go off, become non-trivial and you could you should think that we have some kind of formal power series expansions describe, describing the solution okay um okay and then sort of where uh trace free sorry yeah so uh yeah like i said it doesn't it, that level that won't really matter for uh, the level of detail i'm going to go in right now but yeah it's it's a uh, if you want the trace because the trace of that is determined by right to jury equations really only the trace free part is what you sort of is free to play with. Um, yeah, and, then, and for people familiar with Pfeffermogram expansions, this, this, you know, there, there's a, there's sort of a Dirichlet data and Neumann data. And then the second, this Neumann data is a trace free symmetric tensor on, um, well, in this case, it would be on, on sphere. So that, that's matches up with, with that. I'm sorry? Yeah, so so this v, if you want this v equals zero is a cone. So you know if you want to do the picture, rotate it around, and then it's like covering like you're opening the angle a little bit and, and going in a little bit. How far you can go? Yeah. Or, well, these are formal expansions, so so there's no actual solution at this point. I mean, you can formally. I mean, in fact, you can. I mean, any, you know, uh, you you can uh, given any set of numbers, you can find a smooth function with this Taylor. So if you want, you can consider this formally to cover whatever. That's, but um, yeah, somehow going ahead a bit, you should imagine that if it's going to converge and be general, then it better only, it's probably only going to make sense at a small angle. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, so indeed, so, so, so following up on that, um, so this is the first sort of where Igor and I sort of first got into this. So we were curious about whether um, you, you, these, these formal expansions, when they could correspond to, an, to um, actual solutions, if you can make all of them do that. And, and this is this um, so work we did some, some years ago. So in, in, in the short is that, yes, they, they, they do correspond to actual solutions in suitable regions to so this. So you'll notice that there's, I only shaded this part above it. That's where the equations sort of turn out to be hyperbolic. Again, this isn't too important. The main, the main takeaway from the slide is just that, you know, we had, there were some sort of formal expansions for these solutions and we developed some, some ability to kind of construct space times which have this, you know, the symmetry, but okay, but it's all local, right? And so, so okay, but at least that, that's something, right? But it seems, certainly seems, you know, very far from anything to do with the naked singularity, which by definition is a global, is a global feature. Okay, but we have so some symmetry, we sort of understand. Okay, great. All right, so, all right, so now let's try to actually, you know, become more ambitious. So the first thing you might want to do is you might say, okay, well, you know, if you remember that picture I drew the naked singularity, there was a full asymptotically flat hypersurface. So there's sort of, we have to go backwards and we also have to go forward. So let's, let's talk about going backwards. First. So we have, you know, we want to, we have this cone, we want to fill it into the past, right? If, if um, okay, can we do that? And already here, there turns out to be a serious problem, which, which um, 
in reality, we sort of could have already seen coming. It's related to that rigidity I already talked about, that, that the data along V equals zero kind of had to be trivial. Um, and, you know, one way or another, depending on basically all of the straightforward ways that you would consider filling in the past of this with something, you know, uh, sort of self-similar um, will lead to you having to put something flat. All right, so, 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 so there's this rigidity. Um, I'm happy to talk, talk to people later. I could say more about that um, later if people are interested. In. Um, but anyway, so, so this is, okay, so you're sort of stuck with this. You say, okay, well, all right, well, so what, what does that mean in terms, of, in terms of the global geometry of the solution? Well, this means that basically, um, it's actually, though, though it, it's problematic for the construction of naked singularities, is that it's actually, if you forget about that, it, it, it's actually sort of, it's interesting. Um, this again is, is like these scale invariant solutions of Christa Dooley. What this, this ends up corresponding to, you can physically interpret, interpret this as again, a spherical impulsive wave. So again, you have something flat, then all of a sudden you, you hit this hypersurface, things jump, things sort of become alive. Um, again, there's limited regularity. And this, it's, it's exactly the same. The, the, the metric will be continuous, but derivatives of the metric will jump. It's, it's exactly like the scalar field one. So this is, so it's all of a sudden there's a impulsive wave and then, then the impulsive wave comes in. Of course here, because we can't now, no longer, we, we can't write these down explicitly. So, you know, so now we don't know. It's sort of an open question what the global geometry of this looks like. In fact, I think it's, it, it'd be pretty interesting to see if sort of when the jump is small, if it kind of like in the spherically symmetric case, if it, if it bounces out. But anyway, that, that, that's open. Okay, so, so anyway, these are nice, but basically, you know, they're, they're pretty, they're irregular to begin with, and there's no sense that they become more irregular or anything. So, so this is kind of a dead end for naked singularities. Right, which this is like the, um, these, these are like the, the simple kind of self-similarity. Okay, so we sort of have to go back to the drawing board. All right. Okay, so let's, so let's think. So we have to think, how can we find some analog of the more complicated self-similarity, this K self-similarity? Well, one thing to do is to sort of go back and, you know, I started this whole part, I, I made some kind of, and I emphasized to you that I sort of made some unjustified gauge choices. So let's maybe, you know, before we do that, let, let's try to think more geometrically about the problem. Um, so one property of these, all of these Pfefferman Graham solutions is that we have this, we have this, you know, there's this pass cone of the dilation symmetry. And it's a fact that the, the vector field, which, which, which is conformal, is, is exactly null on this cone, right? That, that's, that just is a consequence of, if you want, of the gauge that I originally worked. That secretly was an assumption of, of like me working in that, that gauge originally. But you know, if you just think about that for five minutes, there's no, absolutely no reason why you know um, space time, which has a conformal killing field, and there's a you know null hyper, there's no reason why the, that should be null on 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 a privileged null. Yes. It is the type of gauge in place of K is. Yeah, that that's so, one of the same. Yes. I meant that before, I guess, but like, what was the motivation for choosing that? Um, well, it's loose. It's not really a good one, other than that. That is what is true on Minkowski space. So the usual, uh, you know, t d by dt plus x dx. What you know that if you write a double null, that's a u d u plus b d u. Yeah. Oh, a chat. Thanks. Um, can he repeat the question? It's hard to hear. Yes. So so um, so it was asked uh, um, what motivated the original choice of the form of the of the scaling vector field, the, the u d by d u plus v d, v d by d v. And I said, there, there wasn't really a good motivation of it. It's just that we didn't, for lack of anything better to think of, we, were, we chose that which was, um, which was from uh, what's true on Minkowski space. Um, but now we're seeing that, I claim that, it, that if you think about it, um, we actually impose a strong geometric assumption about, about the nature of this, this particular column. And, um, so, so what's, you know, it's very natural you say, okay, I mean, it's certainly, well, it's natural that, you know, if you look at the past, okay, let's say, I don't want to say this, if you have, you know, some, some vector, you know, dilation vector field, you might think if there's sort of formally a point where the vector field vanishes, say in some conformal compactification, and you look at the past at that point, it's natural to think that, you know, this vector field will be tangent to this column, right? but, but sort of it's the null, which is, which is too strong of an assumption. Okay, so so okay, so now you can ask: Is it possible? Can I construct, you know, some? So it's going to have to be more general than what I considered. But but can I come up with some more general type of self-similarity where 
you know, my self-similar field on this null hypersurface twists around the null moments, right? Okay, so that, you know, when I, so now when I kind of, you know, so if before on this first picture, you know, my self-similarity, I just slide up the cone if you want, just slide up straight and I see a rescaling of everything. On this more complicated version, I can sort of slide up the normals and then I have to, then I would have to sort of untwist or apply a diffeomorphism. And then I would see something which rescales. All right. Um, if you want, so you could think if such a thing existed, you could think this is somehow analogous to the more complicated symmetry of Prasadulu, where remember I said that, that one you zoomed in and then you had to translate the scalar field, and then you would see sort of a copy of your original space. Okay. And well, the short answer is you can do this. Um, but let me now explain. Okay, so how, but again, so we can't do that, but I'm gonna have to change something, right? Because I said um, we're gonna have to change something about this image. All right, so so despite what I literally just said that we're gonna have to change something. I'm gonna start with the same coordinate system and the same vector field. But what I'm gonna change is that I'm gonna allow, at least in these coordinates, the lapse now to be singular. Of course, it's, it's all gonna respect the self-similarity. So I'm gonna look for a function, say a V over U, I'm gonna to put to, to a negative power. All right, th this of course looks very strange, right? Because I was worried about loss of regularity and I just made it sort of worse, right? But um, the sort of the, the, the trick is that, um, Okay, this is true that in these coordinates, it looks even worse at V equals zero, but I can do a coordinate change. So this V hat coordinate and where, where I can sort of make a, a power of V pop out. And in, and in these new coordinates, sort of, you know, it, 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 things will extend to V equals zero. Okay. Um, all right, so th this is sort of my new, this is my new kind of on size. So I, I allow the lapse out the singular behavior. Uh, and then I just keep in mind that you know, v equals zero, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to understand that hypersurface and these uv coordinates, I have to switch to this hat v coordinate, all right? And you may ask, why, why am I doing two coordinate systems? The reason I like to keep both, so in, in these, these hatted coordinate systems, as I've written at the bottom of the slide, what's annoying, of course, is that the self-similar field changes form. And so that means that the formulas from self-similarity become more complicated. So it's sort of nice to compute the original coordinates and just, you just have to remember, you know, <laughs> um, to sort of, if you want to have quantity of irregular, remember that th there's some, you know, rescaling that you have to do. Okay, that's so. So th this is the new, um, the sort of key idea to, to break break this rigidity. Okay, well, that, I guess. So why why does this break the rigidity? Well, let's go back to the original source. So this was so at the very so already a while ago. I, I told you that using the dilation symmetry, it's a consequence of Wright to Jury's equation, which collapses some equation on the sphere. You got some equation that had some rigidity. So the whole the effect, if you redo that calculation now, but with this, this little kappa singularity in the lapse, this, this extra term pops up, it's four kappa. And this turns out to solve all of the problems related to this rigidity. And again, one way to see that, so I mentioned, you know, how, how could you think about the rigidity? It was that sort of divergence wants to integrate to zero, but there's the square on the other side doesn't want to integrate to zero. And now there's this minus four kappa. So that, that gives you a parameter and you can pick the kappa somehow to make the thing integrate to zero. So if you if you leave kappa as sort of a free parameter, then 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 you've broken the rigidity, and now it's like what you would think basically that you know it's one equation just uses up one degree of freedom. So you could basically g slash could be whatever you want, lapse could be whatever you want, and say the curl of b could be whatever you want if they're all small, and and, and this equation just determines divergence. So you have now you have a whole rich set of, of solutions to this. Um, and then, um, and now, of course, now that we, you know, uh, we've broken that rigidity just on, you know, that was coming from right to jury, we now, we can now go back and ask the same questions we asked with regards to Fetterman and Grant, that is, well, can we actually construct some kind of solution with this? And um, first, first statement is that we, we can. So this sort of by kind of, you know, it's more complicated, but by, by using some of the lessons that we had from that, um, from studying the Fetterman and Grant space times, we're able, again, to sort of, at least locally, again, we're very far from any kind of naked singularity, which is a global, something global, but, but it's sort of one step at a time. So we have this new kind of self-similarity. What I claim is that now we can build sort of locally, we can build something sort of, you know, around this. Um, and in fact, this was even true in the previous result, but, but I sort of didn't emphasize it, but we, we don't even have to study things which are exactly self-similar. So, so what we can do is we can, all right, so on this cone, this incoming hypersurface, we put that self-similar geometry, and then, you know, I can put some data here and I can actually put, you know, more or less whatever I want. Okay, it has to be say small. 
to be sufficiently small. And it has to have, there's some compatibility conditions that doesn't satisfy here. But sort of once you're away from where these things intersect, as long as it's small, it's okay. And you will get, you'll get some solution in some little sort of local region like this. Okay, so that's great. But again, it's still sort of neither, you know, sort of the, the uh, there's still the elephant in the room. How am I going to globalize this construction? And in fact, it looks, if you dig under, if you look under the hood of this theorem, it actually looks pretty bad because, um, so it turns out that if, you know, if you think, you know, I introduced this, this little this singular behavior and if I, you know, I, I don't want to disturb things so much. Let's say that that, that singular behavior, that twisting is say size epsilon, this, this, if this cap over here is say, um, well, cap is absolutely like epsilon squared, but let's say if, if epsilon is like square root of kappa, again, I, I don't want to sort of mess with the geometry too much if that's epsilon. Unfortunately, what happens if I do that, then the outgoing, the, the, the transversal derivatives, of, there, there will be a transversal derivative of the metric here, which will then be size one over epsilon. Which actually, if you remember, a similar thing was in crystal dualism. So, so it looks very scary. So again, for this local result, that's fine, right? I mean, I can, I just go, I, I can go a short amount of time, but if I wanna, you know, understand the entire exterior region, that looks very scary. Nevertheless, um, we are able to globalize the construction uh, to the future. Um, so basically it, you can, you can extend this transversal data in such a way to make it asymptotically flat. Um, the future, and you can show that that no, actually, you know, no black hole emerges. You get it. so this is sort of the this is like the top of the Penrose diagram when you make a singularity. And the key, the, the, the key point here is 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 one has to identify a mechanism why. So this I said there's this largeness. There's one over epsilon. Turns out that if you if you extend this data cleverly, you you can do it in such a way that um sort of th this largeness will will sort of immediately dissipate. So even though there's some there's some derivatives here, which are size one over epsilon, they're huge. It turns out that they, they get driven down very fast, become small. And, that, that, and then sort of once you're, once you're sort of away from B, of course, you always have to contend with the, the singularity to some extent, but that's still a difficulty, but, but this other largeness uh, dissipates. That, that's a key um, sort of key insight, which allows, which allows you to do this. Okay, and then, um, all right, so that's great. And then you also, of course, want to go to the past. And well, you can also do that. This, um, okay, which will appear soon. You can also um, extend, extend to the past. And again, it's sort of similar difficulty. You have this largeness, uh, you know, there's some largeness in the problem. It might scare you, but again, it turns out that you could show that it, it, it dissipates quickly. So in, in fact, um, what's interesting is these, these solutions are, um, and this is also true for Chris Adulu's solutions. So somehow he didn't, because of the methods he was using to study the problem, he didn't need to sort of have this realization, but it's true that again, there's some, there's some largeness here. Like I said, there's a one over epsilon, but, but all of the largeness of the solution is very concentrated near, near V equals zero. And then sort of once, you're, once you move away a bit, in fact, things sort of become small, small uh, in a scale invariant sense, small perturbations of, of flat space. Okay, so that's that. Maybe that's also a good time to ask if there are any questions. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. So, so, so there's a question. There's a chat. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so, so the question was why, so that I, I, I said that the vector field twists around the cone, but that somehow I, I, the way I presented it was that it was generated by this change of variables and just involving V and that you would think that I need to do a change, some, there needs to be some theta change of variables. That's a good question. And I guess it's maybe to some extent, uh, uh, there, there's another important, there's an important thing I didn't say maybe, which I, let, me, let me explain. Um, so, so you're totally right. So let's look at the form of the metric here. So, so the point of, of, of the twisted thing is that, um, so this U du V dV is gonna be the generator of scaling symmetry, right? So in for the original form of symmetry, the Pfefferman Graham type, what happens is that at V equals zero, this vector field B, the shift vector field and the visual language vanishes. And so um, U du is null. But what happens for, the more, for this more general kind, one thing, I mean, 
it's kind of implicit when I said that you can now allow, you can solve for non-trivial B from the constraint equation, the B doesn't have to vanish. So now B is non-trivial. So, 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 um, and so UDU is not null, even though it's, it's generating the dilation symmetry, but the null vector field is D by DU plus B. Okay, but that, that it's true, I, but I didn't, I didn't mention that, that's a little bit. Other questions? Here or before? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on this one and that one. <laughs> no, well, in, th in this picture, you're no longer putting, yeah, it's true. So here you solve this as a characteristic initial value problem. But then, but here we, we this one you can think, I've just drawn V hat equals zero because it's important hypersurface, but there's no, you're no longer putting data on. You should think that there's just data, right? Just data on this. And then you're solving to, to the future. Um, that makes sense? Yeah. Um, yes, so let me, so, so the question was, how can I comment on how this extension is done to dissipate this largeness in Kai hat? Um, I guess I can't, there's probably no way for me to write on the chalkboard, right? People can see it now. Well, um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so what it is, it's just that you can, so you have these expansions and you, you can um, basically, yeah, the short version is you, you can compute to leading or there's some, um, it's similar to the factor gram expansions, but it's, it's a little more complicated because at each, those are in some sense sort of more algebraic. Well, here at each, at each stage, you have to solve certain, you know, uh, computing further terms out, you have to solve certain transport equations, which also are degenerate and would have some, whatever. But okay, you can compute to sort of the next order. Uh, there's some sort of transport equation that Kai hat was satisfied. And, it, and, and you can study that transport equation. And it turns out that if you sort of set up your data correctly, the solutions to this will have this behavior that they, it's true that they're very, very large if equals zero, but they, but they go down very fast. Um, another way to think about it, it's related to, I'll get to this in a bit. It's related to the fact that these solutions will only be have some the will, will like Christodoulos will be C1, um, will only have the derivative will have some holder continuity, it won't be smooth. So so it's like how uh yeah, so it's so it's something like yeah, so so if you imagine if you have the function, um what I want to say. Yeah, so it's like if you have the function like one minus or yeah. Uh, one plus or minus uh, like v to the you know epsilon squared over epsilon some, something like this. Th this is something which will be like at v equals zero will be like one over epsilon. But but if you give yourself a little bit of v, then uh, if you you know you do your uh, they give it as a calculus homework problem to your students, they'll tell you that it's a uh, it's size epsilon when you when you move a little bit away from v equals zero. So it, I don't know if that makes sense. I can we can talk more about it. It's nothing like the truncation. Oh, no, that the truncation is is a no. The truncation is a trivial thing. No, it has nothing to do with the truncation. Yeah. The, this issue is also in Christodoulos. It's just that because of the way he does it, he doesn't need to understand the smallness because he, you know, he doesn't, you know, here to close anything for um, when you're studying the, the vacuum, you need to have some kind of underlying smallness, or you know, there's no hope. And so, so we needed to understand this explicitly. He doesn't need to because he, with the way he's studying his uh, that autonomous system, um, he's doing that with a critical point analysis. It's just not necessary. Um, other questions? Yeah. Okay, so let me um, sort of uh, conclude things just with, um, I mean, we sort of already, with that question, got into it a little bit, but let me just sort of run through some various comparisons with Chris All right, so first of all, let me talk about regularity of the initial data. So, so again, I already, um, I said I, I already sort of started talking about this, but basically, you know, the claim is that there's very good qualitative agreement. So, so across V equals zero, again, we're only gonna have this, this holder continuity of the derivative, which is exactly like in Christodou. Again, away from, away from V equals zero, everything is basically as regular as you want, right? Of course, Christodou is spherically symmetric. Well, well, we're not spherically symmetric. We have angular derivatives. And, um, but in the angular directions, you can cook up, you can make our solution so that basically there's as many angular derivatives as you want. So, um, so you can think that this is sort of, you know, the, the loss of regular is exactly, is, is, is almost exactly like Christodou. Um, this I also already mentioned, but now let me just put on the slide explicitly. Just like in Christodoulou, we have this, this largeness near the cone. 
Um, Chris Avila had this one over, um, so in terms of his parameter k, the derivative of the scalar field is like one over k, the minus one half. Um, for us, the, this, again, particular derivative of the metric, this tf is a trace free part, is going to be like one over epsilon. Okay. Um, of course, there's, there's sort of this important caveat I should make um, that, all right, so I mentioned that in Chris Adulu's setting, there was this well posedness for, for BV solutions, right? Um, and you know these these holder the ones with the derivatives holder continuous were better than that, and that's you know was part of that whole story. We don't have access to to such a result. There's no direct analog of, of sort of using BV um, to study um, Einstein vacuum equations or, or even sim simpler <laughs> simpler hyperbolic equations in higher dimensions. However, um, there has been sort of a theme that has appeared um, sort of recently is that uh, you can tolerate these kinds of sort of you know in fact, even worse singularities, um, you know, along a null hypersurface with the Einstein vacuum equations, if it's compensated by additional angular, angular regularity. And though, you know, strictly speaking, sort of there hasn't been, um, you know, a full well pulse control hasn't been proven, which encompasses the situation. It's very natural in consideration of what's been done, in particular, um, this work of Luke and Rodniansky concerning impulsive waves. It's very natural to, 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 to expect that there would be some kind of well pulse statement, which could cover this kind of data. Um, that we have, but that would be interesting to sort of to, to, to thoroughly work out. Okay, so um, that's regularity. So let's do let's talk about the singularity. Okay, so again, this this sort of um, like I said, the the use of the spherically symmetric scalar field system as a model for the vacuum equations. This is like this this is, has a long rich history, and we even have sort of they're they're kind of sort of commonly understood dictionaries you use when you, when you kind of. You know something is true in, in circle symmetry, and you want to use that to guess what might be true in vacuum. There's sort of there's there are understood ways to do that, and 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 usually one thing you do is that you know derivatives of the scalar field should correspond to to these the double null language, these shears, which are whatever trace free parts of certain derivatives. Again, the specific thing is not important if you're unfamiliar, but there's some there's some uh, standard correspondence that usually is useful to look at, and um, and this turns out to be uh, well useful indeed here. So, um, so one thing, remember, Chris Tudulu's had, there was the scalar field flew up logarithmically, um, equivalently the, well, not equivalently, but, but, but related to the, the um, derivative, uh, the U derivative of the scalar field um, integrates, um, was, not, was not integrable near the singularity. So a similar thing here, you can write that, you can use the, the, the shear and you can integrate it on, you can find suitable null geodesics on this cone going to the singularity. And again, you can write down some expression, which is sort of reparameterization invariant, and this will be this this will be infinite. Um, there are various there are other things you can you can also for example you can find Jacobi fields which uh, blow up as you go to the singularity so the infinite tidal forces. Um, various things and another again just to make this analogy of Christodoula you can also you can compute in sort of the, the natural foliation coming from the self similarity you can do a Hawking mass calculation. Again it's it's basically um, it's basically uh, exactly corresponds to Christodoula. I should say that all, all of these, so, so okay, and, and there's, I'm not even, I haven't written all the different things that you can say. All of these are kind of like suggest some kind of C0 type singularity of the metric, but I, none of them are kind of definitive. And um, I'm not sure what the, what the best way to phrase the nature of the singularity is. I, I think, well, I have some ideas, but maybe they're tentative, but um, uh, I think it would be interesting to sort of, I, I don't know the, 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 necessarily the perfect way to formalize it, but, but yeah, whatever, the various analogies you can make, in terms of scaling and some, you know, in terms of say tidal forces and things, you, you sort of think of them as some kind of, there seems to be there's some kind of C0 singularity uh, going on. Okay. Um, and then, so let me, what how am I doing time? Oh, reasonably. Okay. So let me just close with, let me preempt some of the questions that sort of I'm always asked when I do this. Um, so are these naked singularities unstable? The trap surface formation are, are unstable. Um, Yes, oh, we, we believe so. And, and moreover, uh, it, it, you kind of see why they're unstable in the construction. So of course, I, yeah, I, I kind of slipped it in fast, but I mentioned at some point the, the word matching condition showed up. There was some construction where you could put, um, yeah, the, uh, anyway, there's some, when, you, when you're doing this transversal data, I said there's a lot of flexibility, but there was some, I, I, I threw in that there was some matching condition. And in, in, the follow, in the construction, you can see that basically if this matching condition is violated, then you can see there's certain quantities which to be the order will satisfy 
they satisfy certain transport equations in which you compute that if this matching condition is violated, they, they will become, they, they start to become more, it's a leading order, they become more singular than sort of self-similar, which sort of, uh, anyway, and if you, you can sort of extrapolate from that to, uh, uh, extrapolating from that, it, 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 there, there's, there's a mechanism, you can see, you can find a mechanism by which you would think um, trap surface should form. But okay, we would like, that's something we plan to address in the future. All right, and second, so what about, what does this tell us about all naked singularities being unstable? This doesn't really tell us anything, right? I mean, this, this is just one example of, of, of a, um, this is just one example. And, and certainly there's, you know, it, the best you can say is that you can look at the, so Chris Sudulu has a, a, a truly general mechanism. Okay, of course, in spherical symmetry. And, and I think the best way you could say is that you can see that, you know, his mechanism, in that setting, the analog of it makes sense here, but, but that, that's really the extent of what you could say. It doesn't really give any indication of, of what you could do with a general naked singularity. And then the final natural question to ask, um, can you construct naked singularities with smooth initial data? Um, I expect so, but that, um, but, that, but that remains an open question. And, 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 and it's not clear if it's possible to smooth these out in any reasonable way. I should mention this is also an interesting question already in spherical symmetry. So, um, hey, so thanks. So are there any questions, comments? Yeah. Um, okay, so so the question was about how how we extend to the interior, and in particular, are we solving initial value problem? So that there's no that one is not done by solving initial value problem. Um, I guess I, I really didn't say anything about it in this talk. So the way way that that's done, well, I mean I could give another talk on it, I guess, but I'll give you the thirty second version. Um, what you say? Okay, in in say, let's say in like in semi linear problems or a problem, yeah, where where you look for a self-similar solution like this and you look at the, at the, at the past of the light cone, basically you, it's usually giving you, there's, as you transition over this region, the, the self-similar reduced equations transition from being elliptic to hyperbolic, right? So, you know, so in many standard settings in there, what you would do, um, and, and this, well, uh, you know, you say you, you find it suitable hyperbola sometimes, it would become some kind of uh, elliptic equation with which say, you know, of course there's some degeneration occurring you have to deal with at, at V equals zero, depending on what gauge you use to study the problem. A particular, um, and that's essentially what, what is done, but what, what complicates the situation tremendously is that this, because this, the, the, this twisting of the self, because the, the self similar field is not exactly null on this, on V equals zero, it's actually space-like in some places. So when you move a little bit inside, it's still gonna be space-like. So this means that actually we have to solve this. So there's you end up you have to solve something on a mixed elliptic hyperbolic problem, which which, which you suffer enough and, and you can solve. But it, it it does um that really gives it a very different flavor though than than these other problems. But it, but it's not initial value. It's not you're not solving an initial value problem. Well, certainly because you 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 wouldn't expect to do it sort of going forward because it should be unstable, um, and it could be very tricky to. You don't expect that it's like the exterior where, you know, just, you know, if, so, you know, basically, if you look at perturbations of, of once you have the naked singularity and if you perturb it sort of really far away from the, from the cone, then you expect stability, you know, but in the interior, that's very, you know, probably I would guess on any most, it's very hard to like identify, you know, the class of perturbations which would keep the singularity, um, which would keep the, the Penrose diagram sort of stable. So, so it's not done that way. So it would be interesting to figure out an approach like that. Um, well, okay. Well, you certainly can't, okay. In a first step, yes, you, you sort of cover most of it, but then, I mean, that's not gonna work on the axis, right? So, so at the axis, you would, you would say, you, you, you have a double null gauge, which has some, you know, there also, there's various boundary conditions, whatever at the axis. And then you would say, introduce some, what you know, self-similar wave coordinates, which will then you know where that you actually have which are the and and that sort of if you 
as long as you cover it with something which is like regular enough, kind of when you switch into sort of, uh, um, well, I mean, it's basically harmonic coordinates, you know, then the kind of the ellipticity in there, if you have enough to work with originally, the ellipticity will kick in. It'll make something smooth. But it's important that you have enough to, to, to work with to start. You said you mentioned that there's a scene in the but can you say can you say something about the space time? No, no. Well, the weak limit of the space time is Minkowski space. I see. Um, it's uh, so yeah. So you can understand the limit, but it's not. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah, this largeness is really, really concentrated. It's at a very small. So, so it's sort of too. Yeah. I had a brief question, which was, um, can you tell us a little bit about the intuition as to the instability to trap surface formation? Is it like somehow uh, you can see it already at the level of Rachel Dury when you, when you change things? Is it that you, you're, you're still you know, confident the existence part won't be an issue, but it's the, you know, something else happens? Like what, what's the intuition behind we believe so? It, like I said, there, there's a specific, I mean, if you look, if you think about settings where we where where trap surface formation has been understood, the settings where you know there's a certain say there's an, okay to use double null language for those who know it right there's a there's an amplification of chi half that occurs and then you know and then and then that feeds in the right to jury and then trap surface formation happens fast enough that it sort of lifts, the situation is consistent and so I'm saying so it's it's that kind of you know. Um, mechanism that that is plausible and in the what's what's new here what's different here is where is the amplification of chi hat coming from and that's coming from so if you want so chi hat satisfies an equation um it, it satisfies equation in the ingoing direction and like i said you can um you know if you you can do i guess what is it so say first say assume that everything was sort of self-similar then in the, but but tree chi has a free variable so then you it has some equation the coefficients are determined by self-similarity and and you can look at and in the generic and okay and then there's also some right hand side but let's say forget about the right hand side of that there's some sort of think of it just as a transport equation so you you can look at it and generically the generic solutions that equation will produce something which is which 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 is sort of more singular than the self-similar rate or if you want so that that is an ample so it's getting it's becoming very large relative to in a self relative to everything else um and uh Whatever, and, that, and then and then sort of somehow the story. That's the new the new thing. And like I said, the, the matching conditions that we use in order to make the construction work, we use those to turn off this instability because that would destroy what we're doing. If we need everything to be to satisfy these kind of self similar bounds, so we we cook. We, you know, it's a transport equation. It's the usual thing, right? You know, if the transport equation is zero initial data, then this is zero. But so so sort of we make the initial data you know perfect so that this thing is not excited. This bad thing is not excited. But if you do a general perturbation that would be excited. This thing would get amplified relative to everything else. Feedback, like, like that's expectation. I'm not saying, um, <clears throat> I'm not saying it's a it would be a five page paper. But, um, that you can sort of there's a plausible map. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that there's a scene in the That won't be for us, no. Not for all of them. So it's not the case for all of No, it's not. Well, I mean, they're not spherically symmetric. Right? <laughs> but um, yeah, but you also you have this thing, right? That there's this uh in the example you can show the time for the thing that for every No, I don't think so. No, the statement is that you can find some. Um yeah, and it, it's related to this topological thing that you, you can't find a nowhere vanishing trace-free symmetric tensor on, on S2. All right, let's thank Michael for beautiful.